I will ever be grateful for, uh, to Auburn for giving me the opportunity, and I say that uh, uh, sincerely. I'll ever be grateful to all of the, the people in connection with Auburn, alumni, friends of a lifetime, who had confidence that, that I could do the job. But let me say I did the job, let's say that with the help of gosh knows how many hundreds of people, thousands of people, Auburn people that were willing to work. And I don't think anyone has ever done a job by himself. And there's no fun doing it, something by yourself anyway. You want a lot of people to help you, and I've had it. We honor the memory of Ralph Shug Jordan on this program tonight. He was to Auburn fans the world over, and they are all over the world, their coach and their leader for one-fourth of a century. There are Shug Jordan monuments all over this campus, the stadium which bears his name. 21,000 seats when he came here in 1951. Next month, when the expansion is completed, it will seat nearly 75,000. There's the Auburn Memorial Coliseum down the street and there are others. But that's just brick and mortar. The impact of the man on this campus will be felt as long as people come here to learn and to cheer on Saturday afternoons. Tonight we take an all too brief accounting of the life of Ralph Shug Jordan. We'll talk to his players, his friends, his fellow coaches, and we'll hear from the man himself talk about some of those Saturday afternoons down through the years, as he was so fond of saying. James Ralph Jordan was born in Selma, Alabama. He liked playing cowboys, but he loved sports. Football, basketball, baseball. The son of a railroad man graduated from Selma High School in 1927. He worked for a time to pay his way through that first year of college. He entered Alabama Polytechnic Institute. That was what Auburn was called in those days. In four years that followed, he played football, basketball, and baseball. He was his school's most outstanding athlete his senior year. Not long after graduation, he was called back to Auburn as an assistant. He became the head basketball coach. On one of those basketball trips to South Carolina, he met a Columbia, South Carolina belle named Evelyn. They were married three years later. The young couple's life at Auburn was interrupted by the Japanese bombardment of Pearl Harbor. Lieutenant Ralph Jordan participated in four major invasions. His Purple Heart was won on D-Day 1944 at a place called Utah Beach. After brief stops in Miami with the Miami Seahawks and the University of Georgia in Athens, Shug Jordan returned to his alma mater as head football coach in 1951. After a couple of lean years, Auburn football moved into national prominence. Vince Dooley and Bob James helped in those early years. Then came 1957, an unbeaten season, and the national championship. But before that final vote was in, Sam Adams, sports editor of the Alabama Journal, fearing a Midwestern block vote for Ohio State, organized a letter-writing campaign to Southern Associated Press subscribers, all of whom could vote in those days. It worked. And Sam vividly remembers that Tuesday when he called Ted Smith, the Associated Press senior editor in New York. Well, after I finished talking to Smith, uh, well, yeah, I speak to, uh, I speak to Shug. So he talked to Shug, and I don't know what all they said, but uh, Shug said, uh, said to him, he says, that's wonderful, that's great. And that was about the size of his celebration, uh, the, huh? Uh, and then, then pandemonium broke loose in Auburn. People had, had, uh, had already built floats and everything else, and everybody went crazy. They just tore up the, uh, up the town. Auburn fans came to love and respect Shug Jordan because they knew him so well. He spent an hour with them every Sunday afternoon on the Auburn Football Review with Leroy Paul in those early years and with Carl Stevens the final 13 seasons. A great friendship evolved and the familiar rejoinder, you're so right, Carl, became a part of Auburn football lore. His favorite team was the 1972 Amazons, a ragtag crew short on talent and ability. About the only thing they could do was beat you. Last fall, he talked with Carl Stevens about that team and that game in Birmingham. 
We made some sort of a drive there in the fourth quarter and ended up down around the Auburn 32, I mean the Alabama 32 yard line. And it became fourth down and nine. Well, we didn't have much passing attack. Uh, our running attack, we had not gained a great de deal of yardage that afternoon, so what the heck were we going to do? We couldn't throw and we couldn't run. So uh, I called for Gardner Jett, a uh, little boy that weighed about 145 pounds. He had never kicked a field goal that long. I guess it was a shot in the dark. I remember calling Gardner over. I said, this is a little out of your range, isn't it, Gardner? And he said, no, sir, I can kick it. Well, uh, we made the decision to go for three, and uh, this is the only time in the history of the Auburn-Alabama series, to my knowledge, that both sides of Legion Field stood up and booed uh, for entirely different reasons. The Auburn crowd stood up and booed because they felt like perhaps we had quit. We felt we couldn't win the ball game. The Alabama side uh, stood up and booed because if we kicked it, that blew the line, so to speak, which was 14 points, and that would have cut it to three. Well, bless Pat, uh, uh, Gardner Jett kicked that field goal, and then in sequence, uh, things uh, began to happen, and uh, Gant was the Alabama punter, and uh, of course, uh, two boys, Bill Newton, and uh, they blocked both of the Alabama kicks, David Langner picked both of them up. Now, both sides of, uh, on the first punt, both sides of the Alabama line made mistakes. And uh, if Bill Newton hadn't uh, blocked the Alabama punt, uh, Ken Burnage would have. But uh, the second block kick, the right side of the Alabama line corrected their mistake, but the left side didn't. So the same thing happened. Do you ever get away from 1716? Is it always with you? Uh, no, sir. It's always with me. Uh, by the way, I ran into the Greg Gant uh, a couple of weeks ago. A boy, <laughs> salesperson for, coming for through. For those who don't know, he was the one who had the punts blocked. Yeah, and uh, he uh, asked me out to dinner, and he kind of thought over and said, well, people might think we had something going on with saw us together. <laughs> but we have lots of fun out of it, and it's uh, more, it's, it's good memories, and both the goes good years, especially having played on Coach Jordan. Rush the passer, rush the passer! Bob Gardner scoring this week on this. All right, Landman, Landman, that's the way to get off with the football. Backs, backs, run like a wild man! Wild man turned to lose. Be sharp. Be ready. Let's go. Come on. Let's run it again. He was a conservative man and a conservative football coach, but he believed in preparation, demanded total involvement by his players and his staff. My approach has always been as an individual, and I try to, uh, and I do I preach it to our football squad that it's not just another time it passed. That's an old baseball phrase, you know, towards the end of the season and you're batting 250 and what does one more time at bat mean? Well, every time you go to bat, you ought to try and put your best foot forward. You ought to try to excel because I don't guess we have too many times at bat. So uh, we don't say to them, uh, relax. Uh, relaxing means uh, going to sleep, uh, languishing over in the corner in a big uh, armchair and looking at television with your eyes half open. Uh, so that's not the approach to it. Uh, and then uh, we don't like the hysterical approach where we are crying and tears are running down your cheek and you're biting your fingernails and and all uh, those sort of things. Uh, we like uh, uh, the middle of the road approach. So we try psychologically to, uh, to be slowly building up to a, a burn, an intent desire, and maybe bring it to a climax uh, about 1.30 on Saturday. Those in law times, we don't quite make it. I think uh, one of my old coaching friends uh, described head coaches uh, nowadays as sort of a chairman of the board type of coach. 
Uh, well, it's so true. And so you've got coaches in the press box looking down. They have telephone communication to the bench. A great many plays and suggestions are made from those people who are high in the sky and can look down and see everything. And uh, whereas if you're on the field, you just see a maze of things going on out there at ground level. not an easy way to go to school to uh, be on a football scholarship. It's very demanding of a man physically, mentally, and then of course as the other side of his life that uh, the scholastic end is very demanding too. Uh, uh, the demands on the football field, the demands on in the classroom uh, are terrific. And it's really a tough way to go to school and only the very uh, fit, mentally and physically, are going to survive. Uh, we all do funny things under pressure. And we all do funny things uh, with just plain trying, uh, hustling, uh, being devoted. and. Uh, you, you know, uh, why did so-and-so do so-and-so? And usually these questions come on Monday when there's been about 48 hours of study put on them. And why did so-and-so do so-and-so, which was look so stupid from the stand, so asinine, so dumb? Uh, those are the kind of questions that really annoy me. I guess uh, the old defense mechanism comes to a boil and uh, some poor kid had about five seconds to make a decision. And the ball does take funny bounces and the ball can make you look utterly ridiculous. I uh, try to stay away from embarrassing a boy before 60,000 people. Uh, I find that I'm more conciliatory towards a player that's made a blunder out there. He feels worse than anyone in the stadium. He feels worse than the coach. But uh, at my age and after 39 years of coaching, I still make mistakes. And, and I've always felt and tell our boys this, uh, only the people that get out and try and work like a dog and go out on a limb for something they believe in. They're the only ones that make mistakes because if you sit back and don't do anything, you're not gonna make any mistakes. Yesterday's funeral service lasted just 15 minutes. In keeping with Episcopal tradition, there were no eulogies. Mrs. Evelyn Jordan was accompanied by her children, Ralph Jr., Darby, and Susan. Susan's husband, Tom Pilgreen, and their children, Lisa and Tom Jr. Active pallbearers were former players, Pat Sullivan, Terry Beasley, Phil Gargas, Terry Henley, Mike Neal, and Rusty Dean. The man that has been present for us in a number of ways Husband, father, brother, coach, friend. Indeed, each of us have our own special memories and sharings with this man. Though it is not the tradition in the Episcopal Church to have eulogies at our services of commemoration and commitment, it's probably good uh, that we don't at this time, because I can think of no eulogy, no sermon that is greater than the presence of you people here today. 
Shug Jordan touched many lives. There was a freshman class of new recruits each autumn. Young men who remember him in so many ways. Coach Jordan got up and, of course, as you know, he was such a great speaker and made a, a tremendous talk. And uh, I was sitting here and then Coach Jordan and John Wayne were sitting on the other side. And uh, Coach Jordan made a great talk, as he always did. And, uh, as he was coming back, John Wayne reached over and, and tapped me on, in his voice. He said, you know, kid, you got a great coach there. And about that time, Coach Jordan sat down and uh, John Wayne said, uh, you know, Coach, he said, I think I might have a part in my next movie for you. And uh, Coach Jordan just never batted an eye, and he just looked at him. He said, well, John, I come high. And when he did that, that just broke John Wayne up. But that was just the kind of man that he was. When I got knocked out in Alabama game, and I was just coming to, and but I still was real shaky and unsound as far as to play football. And Coach, I saw Coach Jordan step back away from the team and come toward me, and he bent over to me and put his hand on my shoulder and said, "Hoss, we need you." <laughs> and that's all it took. Whether I was ready to play or not, I was going to play football. Did Coach Jordan ever? Help you along the way. You were one of the first of uh, the black athletes to come here at Auburn. Well, that's true. He he helped me, and most of all, I got my education, and I'm doing things now that, you know, I'm trying to fill his shoes, mm -hmm. trying to teach guys to do things that, like he taught me. You know? One particular occasion, I remember he he talked of the about a movie we were going to see the summer of 42 and he went back to his summer of 42 and what he remembered of you know the war and uh, the pressure that was on him at that time and just went into you know a real oration about what what it was like to have been there and what what this movie should mean to us tonight and uh, then of course we went and it was an R-rated movie and <laughs> very, like very it. much uh, summer beach, <laughs> summer beaches out in California somewhere in the summer of '42 and uh, not you at all. Remember if you won or lost the ball game? The next oh, we day. won. We won the next day. Uh -huh. Did Coach ever get on your case much? Not that much. I was kind of, you know, one of those good guys. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> you know, you know, I was, I guess, a sophomore when he retired mm -hmm. in '75 and. Uh, I was kind of one of those guys that stayed back and kind of low-key, you know. You hadn't been around long enough to get on his good side, huh? Right, right. <laughs> I went to see him uh, the day before he left the hospital, and he was just as sharp as ever, you know. We sat and talked for about an hour, I guess, and uh, he was comical, and just we just reminisced about old things, and uh, he was quick as ever, man. Did he tell you any story? Yes, sir, he did tell me a story. You know, we sit there and I said, Coach, you know, what is, you know, we see Brooks around the corner now and such speed, you know, and so let's reminisce a little bit and remember when I ran around at the corner, I said, what does it remind you of? And he said, slow motion. <laughs> he uh, made us proud by uh, tagging on us a label that only the 57 team, I think, had uh, uh, instance of being the same as being probably the best team that he's ever coached. I think uh, they had to be a good year that year because they had to coach us a lot with the talent. We didn't have any talent. We just had to have all coaching. <laughs> uh, he probably did some celebrating later, but I guess right after that game he was probably too busy being uh, the uh, gracious winner huh? You think? definitely uh, he was always a gentleman and he installed in us to, uh, how to be good winners as well as good losers and we uh, and through our years we had the luck we didn't have to be the good losers that much <laughs> we were playing Houston in the Blue Bonnet Bowl right after our sophomore year and uh, Houston was just kind of really wearing us out and we hadn't uh, been across midfield too much and about midway in, in the third quarter, I think we got to about there 40, maybe 39, and it was fourth and one, and he sent the punter in. And, uh, I sent him back out, and uh, we went for it and didn't make it, and so I came over to the sideline. He walked up very calmly, and he said, uh, Pat, he said, uh, you didn't understand that I wanted you to punt. And I said, yes, sir. I said, I did, but I felt like we should go for it. Well, of course, Coach Jordan could get upset with the best of them, and he got upset, and he told me to sit my fanny on that bench and not to get up till the game was over. And he took me out, and I sat on that bench right where he told me till the, the game was over, so I didn't cross him too much after that. And there were those who worked with him and who worked for him and who competed against him. 
they remember too. There's one story that comes to mind that involved the 1974 Gator Bowl win over Texas. After the game, it was a tremendous win for us, and after the game, wild jubilation in the dressing room, Wayne Hester, who is now sports editor of the Aniston Star, thought about asking Coach Dirty the question, wouldn't this be a nice way to go out? Have you thought about retirement? Wayne didn't ask Coach Jordan because he thought, as we all did, that Coach would go on and on until age, the age limit finally got him. A few months later, it was announced that Coach Jordan had decided to retire and had made the decision prior to that win over Texas. And Wayne speculated about what Coach Jordan would have said, and he asked him about that that night. And Buddy Davidson, our sports information director, said, Wayne, you might have had the scoop of your life. Wayne smiled and said, he wouldn't have lied, would he? <laughs> Buddy, we all remember those uh, pregame reports with uh, Coach Jordan, which you did for radio. A lot of preparation for that? Well, the first time, Phil, there was a lot of preparation. I had every statistic and record on paper that I knew about Auburn in front of me because I thought we'd be needing that constantly. But after one show, I found out from Coach Jordan that he was always prepared in his mind. He knew what he wanted to say. But he didn't want me to uh, tell him what questions I was going to ask. And so as a result, we didn't need all those records and those things. He had it on top of his head what he wanted to say, and we went about it with that approach. He was so eloquent for television that you'd start trying to cut something and you couldn't. You ended up with three minutes every time. That's right. I, I knew after one show that uh, I took up the expression, the coach, I'm going to throw you the bone and let you chew it for a while. And that's the way it was. We didn't have to have but about four or five questions, and he handled the whole show. He could chew a bone. Good. He really could. Coach Jordan and I go back 30 years, better than 30 years. When he was an assistant coach at Georgia, and I was a young fledgling English instructor. He was the first real name in college athletics that I ever knew. Uh, I went on a trip with the Georgia football team to Birmingham, and he uh, just went out of his way to be nice to him, and he spent the rest of his life doing the same thing. Many things come to your mind, uh, many things of a precious personal nature, but uh, this was uh, somewhat of a personal nature. Uh, uh, and it's a little light, so I'll, I'll tell it today. Uh, I was a freshman, and I didn't like to study too much, to be honest with you. And uh, I got a call to report to Coach Jordan's office immediately. So I reported uh, immediately. And I walked in, and my father was sitting there. And in the corner of my, was my shotgun. He had my shotgun, all my shells, my hunting boots, my hunting coat, everything, a couple of fishing rods. And uh, he said, Fob, now let me tell you this. Uh, we didn't bring you down here to Auburn to give you a degree in shooting doves and catching fish and hunting ducks. We came down here for you to get an education. So that's going to stay right where it is in the corner of my office until you get your grades up. <laughs> and uh, I could tell many stories uh, like that. He was a... Uh, he made... Uh, he made football fun. He always said that someday you and he were going to sit down and write a book. You didn't do it. Are you still going to write it? I have no plans to do that, Phil. It was his story and his decision. He said he never did really think that many people would want to read about him, and I think that says something about him as a man. That's one story I'll always keep in my heart. Can you recall your conversation with Coach Jordan when you uh, told him you were going to leave and go be the head coach at Georgia? Yeah, I was even scared when I when I told him that, and somewhat reluctant. Uh, I was uh, in Memphis and I called him, and uh, of course we were right in the middle of recruiting. He was gracious as he always uh, was, uh, and at the same time he said we'll remain friends except one day a year. There have been some ding dong battles between the two of you since then. Uh, any kidding? Any uh, any psyching that's gone on through the years? Oh, I don't think so. I I think that uh, he was always pretty level with me, and I was always uh, pretty level with him. You know, we span a long time. Uh, I was just a young freshman when he came here. He was my head uh, coach then, and then. He gave me my first opportunity to coach, and he was, uh, I was the assistant, and he was uh, the head coach, and then, then it was eight or ten years uh, against each other, and then four or five years after he retired, where we probably became even closer. So in all of that 30 years, uh, he's always been the same, a gentleman and a friend, great coach and a great person. Coach, uh, Shug Jordan was your biggest rival on the football field. How did you two get on when, uh, when the game was over? Oh, we got along well, Phil. Uh, as a matter of fact, we 
we got long way before the game. We stand down by the goalpost and talk about when we we're going to retire and all that sort of thing. Never missed a game. Was there a little kidding that went on at that uh, sometime? Not, not at that, not at that time. Until we'd go to Lee, we'd say something like, uh, "Well, I hope you fun every time" or something. But uh, around a meeting and place where I'd see. Uh, quite often while we, we got on fire. We, I consider him a good friend and his wife both. There was one dark week, I think, just before Mississippi State uh, a couple of years ago. And I recall you saying, uh, talk to Coach Jordan during that week. Do you I recall? sure did. I'll never forget that. Uh, we had just been beaten by Florida rather soundly, and a lot of people uh, were had given up on us really and uh, we were five and three and had to go to Starkville for the first time in 20 some years and it was a pretty awesome task looking at us and uh, uh, one of the most refreshing things I just talked with coach about the situation I knew he'd been there before and uh, his advice was uh, just figure out a way he said I know this is tough figure out a way to win one of these games he said you can do it and uh, you do that, and said everything will be fine. Well, we figured out a way that week. Our players did, and, uh, and he was right. Uh, he had been there before, and I, I won't ever forget that. And, and, and gosh, that's one of the things that just, just sticks with you, and uh, I so appreciated that. James Ralph Shug Jordan, born September 25th, 1910, died July 17th, 1980. This is Phil Snow reporting. Thank you and good night. <laughs>